So I kind of feel like uh, this is the, a guy who needs no introduction, but if you have not come across Scott Kuby before, um, he is a UX consultant, uh, the author of Writing for Designers. Uh, since 2010, he has delivered over 100 public talks and workshops on writing, content strategy, information architecture, and user experience design. He publishes the UX Writing Events newsletter, teaches content strategy for the School of Visual Concepts um, here in Seattle, uh, organizes the UX Content Office Hours and the Content Career Accelerator. So very busy guy. Um, but if you want to get in touch with him, you can find him at kubi.co. Um, and he's on Twitter at Scott Kubi. So with, uh, with all that said, welcome, Scott. Thanks, Paula. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is like, this is a very, I don't know if everyone's from uh, the greater Seattle area, but I just want to highlight like, it's uh, an increasingly like rare and cool thing to have like a, a seriously like well organized and thoughtful and deep meetup community. Um, and so I hope that the folks that are there really do appreciate it and, and give some thought to, to some of those volunteer opportunities and very excited about the new website. And it's a, it's a very cool thing. Um, so. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Jim, and everyone else who's, who's involved. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and thanks to all the regular faces. I see a lot of familiar uh, names. Hey, Mike. Hey, Scott. Hey, Cheryl. Um, oh, there's some other people I wanted to say hi to, but uh, Jesse, I know a lot of folks from the newsletter, so thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so this uh, session uh, today, um, if anyone reads my newsletter, they already saw me admit to this. So um, Paula sends out this very helpful organizing form, right? Like get, send all the info in about your presentation. Um, and there's like a little line there that says, give us a, a pity title. Um, and I, I learned only in hindsight, I don't actually know what pity means. I thought it kind of meant like snarky, um, which is like very <laughs> up my alley, right? So I'm like, well, this is easy. Um, so I went with this, this um, please stop uh, launching websites. They're not rocket ships theme. Um, I later learned it means more like kind of witty and concise, uh, which honestly is, is less my bag. I'm, I'm more of a snark person. So anyway, that was just to get people excited um, and, and set a bit of a frame. The, the, main, yeah, the main thing I'm talking about today um, is something uh, technique that I, um, I will say I have formalized. I didn't invent this. Lots of people like to say that I invented it. I don't mind that because it makes me seem even smarter than I am. Um, but what I'm talking about is, is this technique called content ecosystem mapping. Um, and I think it's, it's something that a lot of content strategists and content designers and people just working on website redesigns, it's the kind of thing you stumble into naturally when you are trying to make sense of this big, complicated digital ecosystem. Um, and to the, to the title of this particular presentation, you know, and thinking that, um, you know, the, there's sort of the old, and I mean old, like classic model, like imagine it's 1998 or it's, you know, 94 or it's 2002, your organization's never had a website before. There's, you have nothing, there's nothing out there. We don't have Wikipedia yet. It's, it's this vacuum. So you do, those people back in the olden days got to launch websites. You would build a new thing um, and you would have this, this clear open sky above you, so to speak, to, to just send this new thing into the world. Um, and that language really stuck. Um, and I think some of it is that, you know, we think about like, launching projects, launching albums, launching, you know, whatever the new thing is. It's, it's this very like agency delivery model based language of um, launching the new thing. Um, and that's not at all what it really feels like <laughs> in my experience of doing content strategy consulting, um, which is to say that you don't really ever get to make a new website now because whatever new thing you're making exists 
in this internet, um, if we want to use this rocket ship and, and space metaphor, um, it, you're launching it into a very crowded orbit already. There's lots of satellites up there. Some of those satellites are ones that your own organization launched 5, 10, 15 years ago. And all the space junk is like, you know, sliding around. And if you're not thoughtful about it, it collides into each other. Um, and you end up with doing things like cannibalizing your own search results with a new support site or with a new marketing site. I see this happen over and over again. Um, so the metaphor that I prefer, and I'll get into the, uh, the first bit of the presentation here to share it. Um, the metaphor that I prefer is that of an ecosystem. So uh, I'm not, I, I studied radio in college. I'm not a science or, or life sciences guy at all. But you know, my broad understanding of an ecosystem is it's sort of the study um, of, uh, you know, sort of a natural environment and the whole system. Right, so it's it's not botany, right? You think about a forest. So it's not just studying the trees, um, and it's not uh, what zoology or whatever animal studies is, right? You're not just studying the squirrels. You're thinking about the whole system. You're thinking about the trees and the squirrels and the fungi that eat the dead trees and the rainfall that water the trees, and that that whole um, the the whole system organic and inorganic things, uh, how pollution and human impact shapes it. That's what an ecosystem is. And I think that's a much more apt metaphor for websites and all the digital things that we make. Um, so on a lot of my content strategy projects um, and even just general consulting, when I'm just helping someone make sense of their big new project, I like to make a map to make a diagram of that ecosystem. Um, and I, I'm prompted to do so when I hear things like, Oops, like this from clients. Uh, I'm just trying to get my head around what all we're doing with content. I don't know how many domains we have. You might be surprised, you might not, uh, but I hear that a lot from folks. Uh, our team, our content teams are all in silos and nobody knows what anybody else is doing. Very common. Uh, there's so much happening with content and we're not even sure where to start or just some sort of frustration, rage, dissatisfaction um, with what my, my old friend and mentor, Christina Halverson calls content chaos. So this sense that there's just like, there's so much happening and there's so much swimming around and there's content getting flung from everywhere and getting published from everywhere and getting reviewed and approved and all these different processes and systems, but it's really hard to get a handle on it. Um, so, Having encountered that so much, I decided there's, there's got to be a better way. Um, and look, I love a content audit. I really do. Um, but, but what I have found is that over the years, because the big red content strategy for the web book talks about content audits early in the book, people tend to start with content audits. Um, and I don't think personally that's necessarily the best place to start if you're trying to do a big new thing on the web. If you were trying to replatform from one content management system to another, if you're trying to consolidate multiple sites into one or vice versa, if you're trying to execute a rebrand all across your digital ecosystem, that's a big heady project. And looking at your content footprint, how many pages you have, and the quality of those pages is good information later on in the process when you know what you're actually trying to do. Uh, and to understand what you're trying to do and the real world that your content lives in, um, I like to do this technique that I call content ecosystem mapping, um, which maybe sounds kind of fancy. We're gonna get it, I'm gonna get into a demonstration here in a little bit. Um, it's, it's really not that complicated. It's listing out all the stuff in your content world, drawing connections between them, in collaboration with people in your organization that need to be better aligned about your content world. Um, I like this definition from Hillary Marsh, um, which is that when your content people and systems are connected, your organization can deliver a holistic, effective experience for your customers. Uh, so in this article, Hillary is kind of arguing that you should think about your content as an ecosystem and design for that. Um, and a very common example of like what I would think of as kind of first order ecosystem thinking is how do the things you how are the things you publishing on your website going to feed into social media? And then how would maybe your social listening, what the responses you get on social media, how might that feed back into future content creation? So we're not just looking at a silo, the website, 
over here, social media over here, email marketing over here. We're thinking about that system. How do we design that holistically? Um, and I think that's a really nice idea and model. And I see a lot of organizations um, kind of start their conversations about new websites with, let's design an ecosystem. The thing is though, um, you'll what I find over and over again, oops, clicking on links here, um, is that your content is already part of an ecosystem. Um, I'm fond of saying there's, there's, for most organizations, there's no such thing as a new website because you have an old website. Or if you don't have an old website, there's already a, websites about your vertical, about your topic, right? It's, it's all already there. Space has been colonized. Everyone launched their rocket ships. Uh, and now your stuff has to exist. I'm mixing metaphors now, but all, your stuff has to exist in this ecosystem. But what most organizations don't have is a picture of that ecosystem. People don't actually know what's going on with content in their organizations. I think content ecosystem mapping can help us figure out what's going on with content. I think it can help us do it more so and more effectively than just a content inventory and audit, which is again, fantastic technique, but that comes when you're ready to make the decisions about what stays, what goes, and how you wanna transform your content. So I wanna talk about mapping a little bit. Um, and this is, this is sort of the theory part before we get to the practice. Um, but, but what I find with mapping is that in design, especially a lot of times people think about it as like mapping a journey. So just showing like, how does a customer move through our universe? Um, which is a good thing to understand, but there's, there's actually lots of reasons to make maps and there's lots of versions of maps that are about more than that. Um, so one reason we make maps to document reality, maps contain and generate information. So we might make a map of our solar system. You can make a map of uh, you know, plots of land and the river basin. You can map parts of the brain with scans. Um, you can make a map of the Mall of America so you know where the five gaps are in the Mall of America. Um, but these maps are all contain a lot of information um, and show importantly show relationships between things. A lot of people have probably heard this quote, the map is not the territory. Um, and folks will kind of use this to disparage maps and map making sometimes, which is to say like, oh no, you really gotta like get into reality to understand it. Um, but what's funny to me is that this is not the whole quote. And if you take the whole quote, it is in fact this, a map is not the territory that it represents. So maps aren't reality, but if it, correct, it has a similar structure to the territory, which accounts for its usefulness, which is all to say like a map can get you pretty close to reality and that's a useful thing. So they aren't reality, but for our purposes, they are close enough. Journeys, maps are great for journeys. This is a list um, from Wikipedia of road trip destinations. These are those same destinations on a map. Um, lists of information of which content strategists are oh so fond, those spreadsheets and lists versus a map of the same information. It's, it's what's wild to me here um, in this simple example, this, this, these two diagrams, these two lists, um, if you think of the map as a list, contain the same information, but this to me is significantly more instructive. Content audit, content inventory, very common form of list. Um, this, I would argue, again, a list, we, everyone loves to jump this slide in. Um, I think it's really hard to plan a journey, right? If I'm looking at this list of all of our content, what do I want to do? What do we want to do next about our content based on this list? I don't know. What do we want to do with our digital strategy based on this list of all these channels um, that we could publish to? I don't know. I think it's easier to have those conversations with a map. Um, maps create borders or allow us to create borders. Um, I used to live in this area of Minneapolis. Here's a map they have of the different wards. So this map tells you who your council person is. Maps help us tell stories. I love books that have story, uh, have maps in the beginning or the end um, or all throughout preferably. So um, here's a map, one of Tolkien's maps of Middle Earth, which helps us tell a story. Um, here's some map-based journalism. So this is a really cool um, and sad interactive from the New York Times a few years back um, where the story responded to a zip code that you entered and gave you specific facts based on that. So maps to tell stories. 
Um, and maps can be used persuasively, which is maybe the biggest point that I want to make um, and want you to consider is that um, one thing that humans have found about maps over the years is because we need to rely on them so much, things that look like and feel like maps, whether they are or not, and this is some dangerous knowledge I'm sharing, uh, they feel true. Once you make something look like a map, it feels very true. So we use maps to persuade others. Um, this is an uh, example I found in, in some media archive. It's really wonderful. If you look closely at the names here, uh, Whiskey Lake, Rum Lake, Brandy Lake, I would love to visit all of these. Uh, but this was actually a uh, temperance map. So someone made this thing that looked like a map of a real place, um, but this is actually from a, a, a temperance league and people that were advocating for prohibition. So um, even the bad guys can use maps uh, to persuade people or the really bad guys could use maps to persuade people. Uh, this was famously hung in the Oval Office and handed out to many reporters that came to visit. One particular map of the 2016 presidential election results. And if you look at it, you think, geez, that's pretty persuasive. It's pretty red, a lot of red. Um, but if you do gradations of color and you see where it merges together, now it's looking less red and you're thinking, okay, maybe that first map's not the whole story. Uh, and then if we add another layer to that and do depth and see how many actual people in those actual places voted for it, now we have a different story. Same information presented differently, different maps, persuading people differently. Uh, so we can use maps to describe reality, plan a journey, establish borders, tell stories and persuade others. Uh, I know you're all smart people, so I hopefully don't have to do too much translation here. Um, you probably find in your work with stakeholders that you need to document reality. You need to plan a journey or plan some work, what you're going to do next and where. You need to create a governance plan, establishing borders, who's in charge of what. Um, you need to tell a story, convince management, convince senior leadership that something needs to change, um, and persuade others, pull them along on that journey. So that's my high-level pitch for why maps are a cool thing. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Uh, and I'm open for questions if people have any, um, but I'm gonna switch over now and show you the process that I use um, and a few examples to make content ecosystem maps. I can find it here. Okay, are folks seeing my Miro screen? Yeah, it looks good, Scott. All right, thanks, Larry. Um, okay, so, so I'm gonna zoop around here really quick. So one of the first questions I always get from people is, can I just see one? Yes, fine, let's look at one. <laughs> um, this is from a public case study. I'd love to show you the whole thing. I didn't um, get the full permission for that, but they, they published this. Um, so I did a project um, with the fine folks at the Getty, um, which is both like a museum and a research institution, which not a lot of people know. Um, and they were working on some, some digital strategy work. I guided them through a long workshop-based project um, and you'll see here, there's some pretty like basic things. Um, get their getty.edu website is one of the big concepts in our map. Um, and separate from the website, we're saying this website's primarily made of what we called the getty.edu web content. Um, and one of the reasons it was important to call that content out is they have this whole other area tied to their research wing, which is their digital, uh, digital art resources. So that's you know the research component, it's their art library, it's the information about all the pieces they have, their conservation and curation work. There's this whole other universe of what their organization thinks of as content, which is separate from their web content, which is things like news, um, information about the museum and the institute, opportunities, professionals, enthusiasts, and so on. So this is part of a big project. There's a larger map that goes around it. Um, but part of what we were doing here was getting in and describing, you know, even putting questions like this right on the canvas. What's the relationship between each of these editorial areas, the content that supports them, uh, supports them on our digital marketing efforts? Um, so the questions that are present in an organization, a lot of times I'll put right on the canvas and start to map it out. Um, this was, uh, just to give you an idea, this was a legend from a map for a hotel brand, big hotel brand, you've all stayed in one um, that I worked with. And they just wanted to get a basic map together to understand their digital content footprint that powered the listings that you or I might see for a specific property. Um, so we mapped out 
websites that were supported by their brand, web content, tech systems, people and teams, branded products, and, and all the rest. Um, so that's pretty common. This is one I worked on um, in my days at Wolfram, uh, which is a co uh, computational technology company. Um, and uh, the CEO of Wolfram uh, is a colorful character, very in love with his own name. And so everything had Wolfram something in the brand name. So everything was Wolfram this and Wolfram that. And it started to get a little wild because you would sort of have Wolframs inside of Wolframs inside of Wolframs. Um, and so did some mapping here to sort of show that, you know, for instance, this problem generator, not the name I picked, um, which was to help people uh, solve and generate um, math problems like for quizzes and stuff, even though that had Wolfram in the name and Wolfram Alpha was also a different product that those were actually like this one was inside of this one. So, you know, if you're in one of those companies where everything is, you know, branded all the way down, right? I mean, just try and look at what like iCloud is like it's a, it's an app and it's a service and it's a subscription like it's it's 50 things that are all named iCloud um, or Adobe Cloud right there's like Adobe Cloud the app and Adobe Cloud the service and your Adobe Cloud plan it's 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 Adobe Clouds all the way down um, so if you're in that kind of situation I think ecosystem mapping can really help so I can come back to these examples if people want to see more um, but I want to dig into let's see here um, oh wait one more example. Um, so just to sort of acknowledge sources, um, where I kind of pull my methodology from um, is actually not from a design background, it's more pedagogical. Um, so the idea of concept diagrams were developed as an educational technique to, um, as a way of like teaching, but also assessing student knowledge. So if someone can make a diagram that represents a concept space like what's the structure of the universe, now you know that that person understands it. Um, and so I really like to show this, this diagram in particular because one of the points of resistance I get from organizations is that people tell me, we can't possibly map our content ecosystem. It's too complicated. There's too much stuff. There's no way we can get a useful picture of it. Um, I understand it feels that way. That is not true. This is a simple, diagram in the style that I'm teaching of the universe, the whole thing. Your content world is smaller than the universe, I promise you. So even though the universe contains dogs and brownies and David Bowie and the Seattle Kraken and the, whoever the bananas were that I want to learn more about that, uh, Savannah Bananas, that's a good name. Um, all those things exist in the universe. You don't have to have all those things in your map. You want to map what matters. So if you're trying to answer a question like what's the structure of the universe, matter and energy. Those are the things that matter, no pun intended. If you're trying to map your content reality, some things are gonna matter, some things aren't. You need to figure out what those things are. That's how you solve for content chaos. Start to map those things that matter. Okay, so how do we do it is probably a reasonable question that people have. So let's just start to do it. If I can find where I'm trying to go, okay. Okay, first, I just have to share this image because I love it. It's propaganda, but it's good propaganda. Good maps make good plans, I agree. Um, so the way that I will do this with a client um, is not quite like this, but you wanna set some categories of things you are trying to understand. All right, you're trying to understand your content world. Well, what are the big parts of your content world? It's things like your channels, where you publish to, um, types and categories of content, yes, obviously. Uh, technology systems and tools, content management systems, all your survey stuff, all your publishing things, asset managers, yes. Um, the governance side of it, workflows, processes, yes. I'll show more about all these in a moment. Um, something I call the operations layer. So if you're starting to get a content strategy propped up, do you have a design system? Do you have a content strategy framework? Do you have a style guide? Um, what are all your products and services? What's the stuff you sell? Where does the money come from? Standards and policies, do you have broad or specific accessibility standards? I've got that in there twice, voice and tone guidelines, um, you know, uh, legal requirements for your given industry, that sort of thing. People and teams, brands, audiences, and your business model. That's a lot of things, it's a lot of things. So you don't do all this at once, you don't do it all in 90 minutes. But what I start to do with clients, um, and I, I would have fewer categories than this to start with, um, but let's say I'm doing an in-person workshop or a mirror workshop. 
Um, I'm going to queue up one of these categories and I'm going to invite people to brainstorm for 5, 10, 20 minutes and just list things out. What are some of the channels? Um, so that might be your, and I've been using the Acme example. So acmeco.com website. There's a channel. Um, we've got a social media presence. Um, things I end up starting to emphasize when we talk about channels. Um, channels doesn't mean platforms, right? Twitter is a platform, but if you're a big company, everything you publish, um, all those tweets that you share publicly, um, promoted tweets, which might be targeted ads that only some of your customers see, that to me feels like another channel. Do you take customer support inquiries through Twitter DMs? Do you have a whole team that manages it? That's another channel. We just came up with three just for Twitter. You might have five Twitter accounts for your brand if it's a big organization. Boom, bigger, 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 lots. So early on, just like any design thinking exercise, we're generating, coming up with lots of things. Um, and then I'll start to poke at, for instance, let's say we've got this website. What are some of the channels within the channels? The homepage is a website, sure, but are there banners, notifications on the homepage? Does it have featured article widgets? Um, what else? Do we have a carousel? Please spell carousel, close enough. Um, oops. So, you know, you're going to go through, you're going to look at um, paid ads on homepage, whatever it might be. You're going to think through like channels, channels, channels. Um, and you can work through this with different groups. So you might have a core working team, but maybe you also shop it around. You talk to the engineers, you talk to product marketing, you talk to different stakeholder groups, different schools, if you're in higher ed, whatever it might be. And you get people to list all that. Um, similarly here, content categories and types. Um, so uh, one question I'll get a lot um, is around the difference between this and like a content model. So I'm not a content modeling expert, um, but my impression in the way that I tend to talk about content models is that is sort of the conceptual underpinning of what kind of content you make. So a press release is like a common content type. And you're going to have a system that describes what actually constitutes a press release. You know, it doesn't have a title, doesn't have a byline, whatever. Um, same with, you know, I worked at a product, a SaaS product company. We had feature pages. That was a really big idea. These huge complex pages just to describe one feature of the product. Um, so that was one of our content types. It had a lot of rules and things around it. Maybe a smaller org, nonprofit, maybe team bios as a content type, whatever it is. Um, but then I also like to start to carve out categories if they're in common parlance in the organization. You have product content, marketing content, whatever. So, you know, you go through and you generate and you generate and you generate. And I can, I can look at um, some more of these if people have questions about any particular um, category. The idea here is you do a lot of generation. Let's get a bunch of ideas on the canvas. That's kind of step one. Um, people are going to have hesitancies around what's worth listing. Do we really like, like, is it worth including? Yes, it's all worth including. Put it on the canvas, get everything out there. Uh, and then the hard part starts, uh, which is starting to map these things. So um, what I tell people to, to do and what can be helpful is to have some sort of focus question. Um, so one that I loved, let's see, get this bigger. One that I loved from a client I worked with, and they arrived at this, um, was how does web content get to customers? That was sort of their question that they were trying to answer by making a picture. How does our web content get to customers? And so that has you thinking a lot about these technology systems, for one thing. What are all the ways that it's actually published and rendered? Um, and that would have me thinking a lot, too, about teams and roles. Who's making the content, publishing it, reviewing it, and so on. Um, so, you know, you can ask one that's uh, very, very basic. What is the shape of our content ecosystem? That could give you some guidance on how to start to map. Um, you could ask a question like, um, how do we want people to experience, you know, our brand online, whatever it might be. It, they tend to be simple, but it's, it's nice to put a little bit of a question together. Um, and then here, let me get that web content one back up. Uh, how does 
customers. Oops. Okay, so I love this one, right? Because what is going to happen, what you will see happen over and over again, um, is I've listed all of these channels, right? We've worked with the team, we've listed all these channels, content uh, categories and types, et cetera. Um, but shout it out in the chat, or if someone wants to, um, if you are trying to find something online, where do you start? Jim wins first answer. The answer is Google, right? So I will work with these. I will work with organizations, and they have been they have been spending months, months often, years sometimes in big organizations thinking about their big dot com consolidation or their big digital transformation, whatever the thing is. And they're so focused on the technology selection, and they're so focused on what they're going to be saying and their editorial themes, um, but they haven't done this mapping work. And so I start to say like, well, you know, the, the easy answer is how does web content get to customers is Google is part of it. So let's keep this really simple. So now we have customers. What's the relation? And then I'll ask the client um, as I'm facilitating often. Oops, let me make this bigger. Um, what's the relationship between customers and Google? Um, and describing those relationships, um, I would say is the crux of what makes my technique a little different than most of the maps I see is that the most important thing that we want to do here is describe these relationships. Um, so customers, you know, we can say something simple, certainly. Uh, oops. Da, da, da. Sorry, let's get this fixed really quick. Like that. And the word I want is search. Okay. So customers search Google. Um, that's just a true thing. This is a little, um, the, uh, the fellows who started the concept diagramming technique for education, they talk about these as propositions. So this is a little proposition of knowledge. Customers search Google. Um, I think what a lot of organizations think is that, uh, so we have Acme Co website. What they think happens is customers, you know, navigate to Acme Co website, customers um, click on featured content, featured content, um, featured content uh, promotes uh, biggest revenue generating. <laughs> you know, the feature content features the biggest revenue generating products and customers come in and buy it. That's the story that, that, that um, the, the dingbats in the C-suite think is true about how digital content works. And it's not, we know that it's not. And they actually know that it's not if they think about it for a little bit. Um, and that's what you can do, start to do with content ecosystem mapping. Um, so a different way of thinking about this and, and the way that you start to win hearts and minds and show people how their digital ecosystem really works is you can say, okay, so the Ac Acme Co website has, for instance, um, landing page content. We, you know, we could even say landing pages. Um, and those landing pages are part of our organizational search strategy. So our, um, so our search strategy, oops, come on. Um, you know, is focused on something. So um, helps us generate leads from Google. So that's what our search strategy is doing. Uh, and, and as you start to map this out, you know, th these are the things like, as you start doing this, people are, and, and you all may be thinking like, okay, yeah, so what? Um, but it's the layers and the layers where this starts to get interesting. So then I might ask a client like, okay, so you've got a search strategy or that's probably one I had to introduce. Um, so who's in charge of our search strategy? Um, and what you want to hear is, oh, like we have an SEO team and this person is, and this role is dedicated. But, you know, usually what you hear is like Craig. Right, Craig is in charge of our search strategy, um, or Candace, or whomever, uh, and that doesn't scale, and is not a good starting point for a governance framework. Um, and it just it doesn't feel. You can tell when you put it down there that it doesn't quite feel right. So you start to think like, okay, so maybe it's not Craig. Maybe it is our um, SEO practice. Let's just say we have one of those. 
So our SEO practice, uh, oops, sets our search strategy. Not too complicated, but interesting, right? I'm starting to say something. Okay, so then, um, and what's easy um, as you work through different stakeholder groups, is people love to see themselves in this map. So we have our SEO, let's call it the SEO team for simplicity's sake. Um, now let's say we have a content strategy team. What is our content strategies team relationship to our search strategy? Depends on the organization, right? Um, could be that they consult on search strategy. And maybe that's interesting. Maybe that's useful. Yeah, the content strategy team could inform. I like that, Jesse, could inform our search strategy. So what's the relationship between the content strategy team and the search strategy? They inform it. Um, you could also, and this is where I'm always asking this question, what's, what's the most interesting or what's the most true? So we could think about these two different teams relating to the strategy, but that starts to feel a little messy to me. So I kind of like to think, well, how does the SEO team relate to the content strategy team? Um, and it could be that they seek input from content strategy team. Okay, so now we sort of see that and we could also have our uh, content strategy framework. That's a cool thing to have, a good thing to have. And the content strategy team is someone who, uh, I like, I always like the word steward, right? The content strategy team stewards our content strategy framework. Oh, geez, now we got the word strategy on there twice. Is that a problem? I don't know. What's the relationship between these two strategies? Which one wins? If we have a question about web content, these are the questions you can start to ask through the process of making this map. Um, and, you know, you could... Um, start to see where these different things live. So you can have um, paid ads. So our search strategy, just for simplicity's sake, includes paid ads. Um, these paid ads lead to our landing pages. All right, so now we're starting to see the real shape of our system. We have an SEO team. They seek input from our content strategy team. Um, that SEO team sets our search strategy. The search strategy helps us generate leads from Google. The search strategy includes paid ads. The search strategy includes, um, you know, organic, evergreen uh, content, right? So the strategy could be, the strategy just for search could include organic evergreen content. Um, but it could be that the content strategy team uh, oversees, creates, generates that organic evergreen content that's part of someone else's strategy. So as you start to work through this, um, it, a lot of the process is like generate a lot of concepts, um, at, start to ask people what's important in your world. How, like, what are the things that are important to get web content to customers? So now if you're starting to talk to the IT team, um, or some of your engineers, they're gonna have different answers to that question of how web content gets to customers. So where did technology go, right? So you've got landing pages um, and, you know, whatever they live on, they're published by, housed in, whatever makes sense for your organization, you start to map that out. Um, and the further that you go, you know, at some point this is going to get really messy and you're going to be connecting everything to everything and it starts to feel a little overwhelming and that's totally normal. Um, and, and that's when you just start to take a step back and focus on what are the connections that matter. So we're generating, we're mapping, we're connecting. Um, and then we're always kind of coming back to the question, is this, is this painting a clear picture or not? Um, and as you're going through this, you might decide like, okay, like we're actually getting really far afield. And what we really want to be doing is interesting as this is, and this is just a, for instance, um, this is, this is similar to one that I worked on for a client. Um, what does a consolidated, um, one platform, what does a future uh, it was something like this. What does the future user-centered one platform web presence look like at, and for our example, we'll say Acme Co. 
So um, to answer one of the most frequently asked questions, am I mapping current state? Am I mapping future state? You can use this for either. Um, but imagine how this starts to change the equation and what you could do from having taken the mapping work that you already did and started to focus on, okay, what do we want this to actually look like in the future? What would that look like? How would that feel? Um, and I, And a lot of times what you'll find is that this technique is weirdly good at getting people to imagine the future without starting to argue with each other. Because um, it can be really hard and scary to talk about change. If you start to talk about removing websites, about consolidating websites, about changing things. Um, and I'm gonna do a, a really lightning quick demonstration here to show you why that's the case. So let's say you have prioritized audiences. Good job important part of content strategy. So you prioritized your audiences. You have audience one, audience two, audience three. And maybe it actually goes and goes and goes and you have a lot more audiences that you're serving. Um, and then let's say for historical reasons, you have the big fat marketing website and you have um, the specialized member website and you have... Um, here, I'm the audiences three through 400. Um, you have the, uh, the hundreds of marketing microsites that sales created. This is not an uncommon situation that I run into. Um, and what you find is, right, so we had this big fat marketing website was focused on audience one and the specialized member website was focused on audience two. And we have hundreds of marketing microsites um, focused on audiences three through 400. And what you want to do is get it to, for instance, um, maybe your first battle is like audiences three through five. We want to consolidate. Um, we could actually show people how audiences three through five includes uh, group one, group two, group three. So, you know, so, and, and, you know, ad, ad infinitum, you keep going and you show people like, okay, when I say whatever your term is for audience, oops, ah, that always gets me, for audience three, um, that's gonna include these people and these people and these people. All of those stakeholder groups that you've told me are important, yes, we're still gonna have products for them. We're still gonna have content for them. Don't you worry. Um, but what we're going to start to do, friend, is still care about these audiences, but these are going away. Oops. These are going away. We're getting rid of the marketing websites, but we still care about these audiences. And we know that you still care about these audiences, friends. What we're going to do is create a, um, let's call it a, you know, whatever, don't do this, but a personalized content engine. We're gonna have a personalized content engine that runs on the big fat marketing website that helps us serve up and generate content for these audiences. So you can show people like, here's, here's what you're concerned about. Here are your audiences. Here are the products that we're still selling and supporting. None of that's changing, friend. I've heard you. Thank you for being part of our stakeholder interviews. We're still, we still care about you. You're still part of this company. And here's what we're imagining. We're going to find ways to serve those audiences you care about in this new way. And the benefits are these. Um, because you could show them that the Big Fat Marketing website has um, improved search presence, which is going to mean leads. And that's what you really care about, isn't it? Isn't that why you had all these things? So if you sign on to my proposal for this new big fat consolidated marketing website, that's going to mean an improved search presence. And that improved search presence is going to give you leads. And I'm going to make leads big. I'm going to make the text really big. I'm going to make it bright red so that you don't miss it. Leads, hooray. Uh, this diagramming, like I talked about, maps look true, maps are weapons. You can weaponize these to win people over, persuade them in your organization about bit, what seem like big, scary, impossible conversations about change. Another way to use this, and then I want to switch over to some questions, um, is to think about, let's say you make a pretty quick map around your current state. Um, a wonderful thing to do about that is to take the map as a visual and start to ask people, 
Um, what are some of the sticky points for you in this? Or what's keeping you up at night um, when you look at this diagram? Or like uh, the great one, like what would you change about this diagram if you could? What would you change about this reality? Um, and it's this is subtle. This is an advanced facilitation technique that I'm now giving you for free. Um, it is a magic trick to ask people, what would you change about this picture? Because that doesn't seem scary and that doesn't seem political. People can talk about changing the picture when what they're really talking about is changing the organization, which is a very hard thing to do, especially if you don't feel empowered to do that or feel like you might upset the apple cart or step on someone's toes if you start to talk about changing the organization, changing the picture. You know, you can look at it and you could, and that person can say, um, and they often do to me, like, I guess, you know, they might say, well, I've always wondered why we have this secondary CMS, which is WordPress, WordPress, which only serves up our uh, event content. I just, it never made sense to me. It feels like a lot of work. I only do one event a year. And every time I have to like go talk to people and relearn how to use WordPress, I just don't understand it. I guess I'd always thought, why can't we just have event content on the main CMS? Like those are the conversations that are already floating around your organization. Um, but when you start to draw a picture of it, you can, you can show before and after. You can get people to respond um, in a way that feels less confrontational about how they might change reality. People want to have that conversation. They want to think about their content as an ecosystem. Um, but when we give them site maps from our launch and say, you own this column, we're literally assigning them to verticals. It, it's just not how the, the world should work, in my opinion. Um, and these kinds of more dynamic ecosystem mappy style diagrams. This is from one I did um, for Sophia coming up, um, one of the speakers for this meetup, which I'm excited about, uh, mapping out her content universe. You know, these are a couple of big concepts in play for her. Like you just start to see that like, what are the big concepts? What's, what's really the shape of this universe like? Um, and you just get to have more, much more productive conversations in my experience. Okay, I'll stop talking for a minute. What questions do people have? What do they want to hear more about or see more about? I'm looking through the chat. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I'll jump in, Scott. I'm curious yeah. about like the your the ethics of your giant red uh, lead <laughs> dot. <laughs> no, if you yeah. can talk because this is a powerful technique, and with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think the um, to to borrow uh, to extend this this idea. I mean, I think there is a little bit of like a Stephen Colbert truthiness kind of thing to these maps, like. The map's not the territory, but if it's an accurate map, it's it's a, a reasonable substitution for the territory. Um, and I think there is, you know, doing something like this, and this is a little bit of an extreme, the idea of like um, changing shape, changing color, um, just even how you orient the map, like what's in the center and does it look like things are connecting to it or coming out from it? Um, those are all really powerful rhetorical techniques that I actually think you should use. You should 100% use um, because so much of your job, especially as a very senior or advanced content strategy pr practitioner, your job is facilitation and persuasion and to get people on board with big, hard, scary, complicated things. Um, so I think the ethics of this, so to speak, are if you are guiding people in an ethical way to a good decision, you should use every weapon in your tool belt to get them there. Um, I am, when I'm facilitating, I'm sort of taking people on a journey um, through this act of facilitation. But if I'm really invested in this, um, I also have a, a rhetorical objective. I have something I wanna convince them of. I may want to persuade them, y'all are doing too much. And you shouldn't do this big new thing because there isn't room for it. You, you can barely manage the stuff you have. Look at this fucker. It's too complicated. Where are you going to put the new thing? Right? That's a conversation you can have with this. You can also have a conversation of, okay, it, everyone told me that this was the big center of activity, that 80% of their energy goes into this. But you've also told me that this big thing in the middle, this big website or this big project is actually only relevant to these customers. And that's 10% of your, your audience. What about the other 90%? Does it feel right to you that this is so big? 
no, it doesn't feel right. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, there's a really wonderful technique, um, workshop, um, that I was, was lucky enough to take from Steven Anderson, um, and Carl Fast, if anyone gets to do it, I, I've lost track of what the name of their, their latest piece is. I think they have a book now. Um, but that, that, the whole day workshop is just about like how you can sort of use visuals and diagrams and techniques to persuade and influence people. Um, your designers are doing it. Your engineers are doing it. The CEOs are doing it. Everyone making pictures is doing it. And I think you should be doing it too. Hey, and there's another question in the chat from Cami. Um, who should be in these conversations? Yeah, great question. Um, so there is a, da, 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 I'll drop the link in the chat, um, but I have a whole resources page on my own website. Um, but the most thorough version of the answer to that question is in this article, which is how to plan your content ecosystem mapping project. I wrote this when I worked at Brain Traffic. Um, so I have a whole list in there. Um, but you are generally going to have a few groups. So you're going to have what I call the core team. And those are the people dedicated to like, making this work happen, doing all the mapping, sharing out what's been happening, making the project plan. Um, and if there's a decision that we're on the fence about of like what goes or what stays in the map, the core team is doing it. Um, you're gonna have a larger working group, which is usually the same size as whoever is concerned with carrying the work forward on the big digital thing. So if there's a big team, if there's eight or 10 or 20 people, that are all on the dot-com consolidation team or the website redesign team or the rebranding team or whatever it is. I want all of those people pretty invested in the project. So some sort of relationship to why you're doing this at all is a good level. And then out from there, um, I think the more stakeholders you can involve, so much the better. Um, a really nice thing about this technique and one reason, so this is their summary of it, um, I've lost their names on Novak and Kenyus. Um, the reason that these uh, fellows like this technique um, for education is that it's, it creates a really efficient conversation between a student and teacher. Assuming the teacher is an expert, if the student shows it to them, you can just really tell right away where something is wrong. So if you are concerned about technology or your content footprint, I like to show this map and at least have one hour where we work with the IT team. Um, if marketing is maybe only a small part of it, yeah, all right, still get your product marketing folks involved. I think a little input from a lot of people can, can be part of your process and actually part of the story that you tell at the end of how did this map come together? Where did this come from? And the longer list of suspects that you can show of people that contributed, again, the truthier it feels, the more that people are gonna believe that this is a real map of your content reality or a real map of your vision of the future because of all the people that you involved. Um, so the short answer to the question is everybody. Get everybody involved that you can get any time <laughs> from, um, but not so many people that you can't move forward. Cool. I, I think that's true of just about any big content strategy work. Nice, thanks. And there's a pretty specific, I, I like this question from Jesse. Um, uh, I ask, at Getty, I imagine there were physical content artifacts that could be digitized but weren't yet. Uh, curious to hear anything you learned about that. Um, or, or is that a weird case? Are there like, tangible tangible physical things you need to account for in these kind of maps yeah so i'll, I'll take it and turn it a little bit um that wasn't quite the case on the getty project jesse except in as much as um they had very reasonable like sometimes our silos are unreasonable like we just we've federated and separated content like marketing and support content for a, a digital product why oh why are those so separated doesn't make sense to me. But at Getty, like they had, um, and this is true of a lot of institutions, like, like content was a product that they have. I, I've done this work for like publishing companies too, like a, a, a you know, scientific journals. Um, and the content, what they've historically thought of as the content is a product. It's like, you know, it's like what you would find in a library. It's journals and artifacts, like it is the digitized version of those artifacts. It's all this stuff that is like, it's not web content. It's not for the general public but it can be of use to those teams. And so mapping the relationship between like, what do we do with like our library content and this big trove of stuff, which is really one of our products that we sell access to. What do we want the relationship between that content and like the fun stuff we put on the website that maybe gets people to think about donating to us or coming to the museum with their family. Um, and so like just having the conversation in the organization about what do we want to do about that is really important. 
Um, maybe a more salient example, I did this for um, a financial services company and they, um, you know, so think investment products and, and that sort of thing, big traditional company. Um, and they had really siloed product teams that had their own marketing, own sales, everything. Um, they were, tr they had very small UX team all trying to share and use one dot com homepage and their handful of marketing pages. And these people had really different products to sell, really weren't talking to each other. And they leaned super hard on physical marketing. Um, so postcards, mailers, leave behinds, brochures, et cetera. Um, it was important to map the relationships between not necessarily the digital content and the physical content, um, but between like uh, what you might think of as like inflection points in the organization. So a new product launch, like would cascade through the organization. Things have to change on the web. Things have to change on print. Things have to change in the um, social campaigns and the, the online campaigns and the billboards and maybe what logos they send to the baseball team that year. Like for, you know, for the, the billboards, like, um, so just sort of letting people know that like, the decisions we're making like cascade all the way through this organization in print and digital. Um, so although I often talk about this as like a digital strategy thing, because um, I think that's where it's the most salient, I do often end up mapping physical touch points um, in an ecosystem map, not in great detail, but enough to make a complete picture. Cool, thanks. Um, Another question from Bridget. She's curious about what this looks like for content types, or is that getting into uh, content model territory, pun intended? Yeah, no, I don't think it's getting into that territory. I think that's always a line um, to walk. So, okay, so let's let's map this a little bit. What did I have here? Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So um, one of the things that I think can, can really help, um, and, and I'm starting to realize this more and more, even just in, in recent years of, of my work with this technique, is that taking some of these abstract concepts, like our content model, like our sitemap, like our taxonomy, like our information architecture, uh, which are all related things, but aren't the same thing, um, actually putting concepts like these on the map can be really helpful and actually can be a really useful way of explaining these concepts to stakeholders. Um, and the way I've talked about it before, I would not personally use this technique to create your whole content model. And again, for people who are less familiar, like I understand content models, it's like, it's kind of the system for, for like types of content that you have, how they get assembled. You know, it's sort of like, you know, in the way that like Lego is a system of like, you can build these certain things and they all snap together in a certain way, but there's kind of conventions where like the little Lego head goes on the little Lego body, goes on the little Lego legs. Um, so you can make a little mini figure in many different ways, but that's based on a system. That's sort of what a content model does for you where a press release doesn't always have to, they don't all have to be identical, but they're gonna have the same like constituent components. We're gonna have common labels for those components. We're gonna know who owns them, where they come from, et cetera. Um, so content ecosystem mapping can be a really good starter culture for, for like a jumping off point for your content model. So you might get just the basic types in there. So our content model um, describes a uh, system for, uh, okay, so here's a good one. Um, so content templates, this is a really good one. So we have content model, we have content type, we have content templates. This is like, seems like it has to be the behind the scenes work that only content nerds understand. But I find you can actually explain this stuff to, to normies, right? To people who aren't going to content strategy meetups. And you can show them um, that, so we have content templates, um, page types and web pages. So we have web pages on our website. Those web pages um, are based on one of several page types. Those page types are, oops, those page types are um, based on, let's even call it designs, content templates. So now this is maybe a deliverable for your web redesign project. The design team, the UX team is gonna make the content templates. Um, are we base the page types, right? So IT is making page types based on designs, content templates. 
designs content templates are based on content strategies uh, based on, you know, and I would put more of these concepts in between, but those content templates are based on content strategies, content types, which is a more esoteric description of the types of content that we have. And the content types are described in this thing we have called a content model. And so how do we decide which content types we have? Um, you know, feature pages, that's probably more of a page type. Um, but we know that team bios is a content type and that course descriptions is a content type. Um, and where this gets really interesting and I think is useful mapping at this level. So let's take the higher ed example. You have a course description, that's a content type. It lives in this content management system and it's got an instructor and a schedule and an abstract and an extended abstract and requirements, right? That's all the stuff that you might like put together into the content type that is a course description. But maybe you have two different kinds of web pages that that shows up on. So you have a course preview page and you have full course overview. Right, the course preview page, maybe that's like part of your search strategy. It's got a big splashy hero graphic on it. It's like, it's a little less in depth. There's more pictures of like, you know, kids of every race all learning together, whatever it is. Like that's, that's gonna be on like, you know, maybe more of a marketing focused landing page, but you also have a different audience, which is people who are actually signing up for classes right now and they need a full course overview. So you can sort of show how you know, these are actually two of our different page types. That's more of a technical concept in our content management system. But that that course, oops, that course description is one content type in our content model. And that actually powers both of these pages, right? And you could even get into, so course description entity in CMS or something, right? So now we know there's like one thing in the CMS the course description is a content type. We specify the content strategist defines all the stuff that it has. Um, maybe the, you know, but we, we have different contexts for it, different pages. So again, I wouldn't, get, what I wouldn't get into at this level is like, so now let's say we have a course description. I wouldn't get into that stuff I was listing, instructor, you know, uh, abstract, et cetera, et cetera. Like once you're into the details, that's not for this. That's not for ecosystem mapping. At best, what I might do is something like this. And I'll take these bubbles and I'll make a midi bitty. Um, and I won't draw relationships. I'll just add them as little Klingons to the big uh, center one here, just to show like that's sort of an EG or by way of example, or like here's some additional detail that I'm adding in. Okay, that was sort of, I feel like I just went down a big rabbit hole. I hope that was helpful around content modeling. Short version, yeah, I think starting here helps you figure out what you need to do next for your content model. I wouldn't build out the whole content model this way. I think there's better techniques for that. Hey, next question from Sabina. Um, when is it most appropriate or helpful to make this style of map? And when is it borderline inappropriate to make one, if, if ever? Hmm. I've never had the second part of that question. So I'm gonna I'll think, try and think about that while I talk. Um, the best time to do it is before um, you are pot committed to the huge big thing that you're about to do. Um, so if that huge big thing is pressing go on the project to consolidate all of your websites, if it's pressing go on starting the rebrand work, if it's pressing go on integrating all the content from the brand you just acquired, whatever it is, like if a change is looming, but it, it's but it's still kind of amorphous and the work's coming together and the project managers are starting to assemble burn down charts, do this now. Go, 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 go. That is the best time to do this. Um, I think maybe the second best time to do this is when... If, if you are in a slow moving organization, which tends to be a, a lot of them, but if, you know, a, a classically slow moving organization, um, higher ed, government, nonprofit, lots of layers. If you feel, see big change on the horizon. So you're looking at like, 
you know, we just got a new director of marketing or they just reorged the marketing or communications department. They're going to have some new ideas or we've got, um, we just got an end of life notification on the weird CMS that we signed up for 10 years ago. It's got 18 months left. We're going to have to do something in 18 months about our digital strategy. We don't know what. Also a really good time to do this. So like, you know, if you're going to go on a road trip, it's better to look at the map and think about where you want to stop before you start driving. Um, and, and, you know, to extend that metaphor, like it's, it's good to map that territory before you start walking through it. Is there a bad time to do this? Um, I don't know if there, I think there are more and less opportune times. I think, I don't think there's like a wrong time to do it. I think there are times that you're going to try to do it and you will meet a lot of, a lot more resistance than you might at other times. Um, and that is like, you know, everyone, like we already committed to whatever the shape of the ecosystem is when the project plan kicked off six months ago. And yes, there's still six months more of work. And yes, Scott, you're asking really good questions about why we're doing this and what we are planning to do with everything after it's done. But like, ain't nobody got time for that right now. Like we just, we want to keep heads down and get through this work and then start to think about how might we do this better or how do we want to document and describe this ecosystem going forward? Um, so, you know, you'll find greater and lesser appetites for this kind of work at, at different times. And, and some of that may just be like riding the organizational wave um, of, of where people are, are at. Um, that said, you can start doing this on your own. Um, and I, I use, you know, I, I may be a little more adept at um, this kind of work than some people just because of how my brain works. Um, but I, I use this kind of diagramming as visual note taking in all kinds of conversations. Even if you don't have budget on your project for ecosystem mapping, you could still start doing this while you talk to stakeholders. Um, my friend Michael Metz used a similar technique to this when he took a new job recently. Um, and it wasn't an ecosystem map, but it was, it was a concept model. Uh, and he would make a concept model of the things that people told him about the organization, how it worked, um, who, who they cared about, their audiences, their stakeholders. Um, this is just a really nice way to, to capture and reflect knowledge and show just like um, they're using in an educational context, you know, to, to show um, that you understand how the knowledge is organized. Um, and, and one reason for that, um, there's a really cool thing here they talk about this is a little bit in the in the nerd weeds, but if anyone's interested, um, you know, I used that metaphor earlier of like you know the all the all the rockets have been launched, all the satellites are already up there. Um, what I'm talking about is uh, is the digital landscape, yes, of all these websites already exist. Um, but I'm also talking conceptually about constructivism, which is like once our brains are fixed at a certain point, this is like an educational concept all new knowledge that we absorb, and this is true in organizations especially, um, is added in the context of what we already know. So like, there's, there's no, you, know, you sort of think of it like a closet, like a, you, you move into a new house, you've got an empty closet, so many possibilities. Um, and you put one box up on the shelf, everything else that goes in the closet is in relation to that box. You can't, like, you don't get to put two things in there the first time. Um, and that's how organizational knowledge is. So whatever you are doing, whatever you're, you're mapping, whatever concept you introduce, brand you add, product you launch, feature you bring into your product, um, the, the landscape already is there. Uh, and so that's why I like, I don't know if there's like a super bad time, like start doing it when you can do it. Um, try practicing this te technique wherever you can to, to reflect that knowledge. Um, cause, cause that's how it actually works. The shiny decks with the clean diagrams that show this simple future. Those are the fictions. These maps are, are closer to reality. Cool. Hey, got a question from Kara, uh, wondering how, or if you include data and analytics here, or is that better used in other stages? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll use it sparingly, um, but judiciously, I guess. I like to put big impactful numbers onto a map um, if I can. So if I'm trying to show, um, you know, you could really add it as a layer on, uh, I'm looking for a good example here. 
you know, so this would, this would be an overly simple one, perhaps, but, you know, let's just say you had this concept on your map of website visitors, um, and maybe you know that just broadly, you've got a million website visitors monthly. Boop. I would add a little, I would add a little data point for that. Um, if you know that a certain product, uh, you know, your silver plan subscription generates 200,000 in monthly revenue. That's a nice little thing to add here. Um, I think like sort of adding the data layer shows people how um, the things that you're doing and talking about connect to the business model. So I didn't add a bunch of, uh, I didn't talk about this one as much, um, but I think a little bit of business model, business modeling, or if you've done like a business model canvas, um, some, getting some of the ideas from there onto the canvas, I think can be on, under your ecosystem map can be really useful. So showing, um, like at some point, ostensibly, even if you're in higher ed, um, certainly if you're a nonprofit, you have to do fundraising. Like all of this activity at some point generates some money, right? I would think it generates some money. Money's coming in somewhere. Um, and that ends up being a moment that, that changes in a good way. The conversation, a lot of these mapping workshops that I do with people, uh, you know, it's like, okay, you just told me all the stuff you do and all the stuff you're publishing and all the guidelines and policies and all the marketing, all, like there's so much content happening. Why does it feel like chaos? Well, a lot of times it feels like chaos because we haven't done the work to connect it to the business model. We publish all this stuff in pursuit of some KPI that we think impacts revenue. Um, so thing, I think any of the kinds of things that you might have in your KPIs, key performance indicators or OKRs or whatever, like whatever model or framework for goals your organization has and for, for measuring things, um, showing that you speak that language or at least are cognizant of it in your map, I think is a really good idea. Um, I don't try and put things in that are like, you know, I, personally, like I'm just because I don't care about this stuff anyway, but like I'm not putting, putting stuff in there about like NPS scores. I'm not putting stuff in there about AB testing. Like I'm not doing like analytics kind of numbers. I'm, I'm kind of doing more of like business numbers if you have them. Yeah. And Scott dropped a comment in at the end of the chat about that. He said that in their modeling, they've used sized bubbles to, sure. to indicate uh, the volume of content or, or similar kinds of things. And there's yeah, another I question that too, because that's a really yeah. quick way. If you're doing that, A, it's visual. So people don't even have to look at the numbers, um, which makes it feel more truthful. And then B, um, you can ask people how they feel about that, right? So one of the, one of the challenges you'll see in a lot of organizations is that we've got, we've got, this, land, we've got this feature page, this checkout page, whatever. We got, the, we got the money page, right? We've got the thing that makes money. Uh, and then we've got this uh, evergreen SEO article from 2014, that generates like hundreds of thousands of monthly visits. And if you can show, boom, here's this big old page on our website that just dominates on Google. And maybe it's a whole little network of them, but you know, and then here's how many of those people that like actually make it from that page to the page we care about that gets people to convert. Um, that's a really interesting story. And showing that, especially with size, I love that tip, Scott, is like that that can be really persuasive. And that's how you can maybe sometimes kind of like finally win those fights that seemed impossible of like, dude, can we like, can we kill this ridiculous old attachment to this organic search strategy? Like it doesn't matter how many people come to this page or how popular it is because they're not buying anything. So yeah, I love that. And Kirby has a question. Um, what would you say to others to get them to participate um, in this? Yeah. Place? Mm. Um, it's tough. I, I think that, you know, some, some people are just going to be indifferent to it, which is great. Like, Hey, like, what, can you come join this workshop um, and, and contribute? And like, I, I guess maybe why I'm hemming a little bit is what I don't think works well is overselling it. Um, I actually think that the do the minimal amount of selling people on this that you can plan a workshop, plan some time, keep it small, you know, you can keep anybody in their seat for about 90 minutes. Beyond that, everybody starts to get a little twitchy. I wouldn't just go right out of the gate trying to get 20 people to two-day workshop, although I've, I've done that before. Um, and if everyone's, you know, if, if, if you can let people know 
what decisions are going to come out of this, which isn't, it's not always decision driven, but sometimes it is. If there are decisions coming on the other side of it, people are going to want to be there because they want to advocate for their brand, their people, their product line, whatever it might be. Um, but I think the, the simpler way to do it is you appeal to their um, pride, I guess, and let them know that you, and you know, you do this honestly, excuse me, let them know that you need their expertise. I like, I need, it's the same. How would you get someone to do a stakeholder interview? It's, it's pretty much the same thing. Like, like we, we need your input to build a more truthful picture of our organizational reality because we have some big conversations upcoming, uh, big conversations coming up about change. We want to make sure your perspective is represented. Um, if that's not interesting to someone, you know, that, that's a bigger, different problem. That's a conversation to have inside your organization. Um, so I think just kind of letting people know you need their input. You've got a technique you're going to walk them through. I just, I'm always telling people you don't need to prepare anything. Um, just come in like, like the, what you need to do is bring your expertise. I'm going to show you, walk you through this diagram. You know, it, it, if I've got a core team of people, that's a fun group to get everyone doing sticky notes in a room or contributing on Miro. But a lot of times I'm just doing what I did for you all, which is like, I'm driving, I'm listening, I'm capturing while they're talking, you know, keeping it simple. And Ben has a question. Um, how much could we as content strategists get a map started on our own? And when would that be detrimental um, to including stakeholders? Yeah, um, you can always get one started on your own. I I'll do it a lot. Uh, you know, and if you, if you look at the, you know, one of the under, so the sort of two underpinnings of this technique that I use, um, one is the um, sort of educational, version of this, in which I would call a rigid concept diagram, which means you're always defining the relationships. Um, and there's also the, the broader idea of concept modeling, um, which is a just general UX design technique. Dan Brown's book, Communicating Design, talks about concept modeling. Um, I'm making concept models all the dang time. I'm always making pictures like this. It helps me think and sort through things, um, even if I don't show them to anyone. Um, I think what you, where you can go awry and where I would be cautious about doing too much on my own is if you're thinking future state. So if you haven't really involved anyone and you make a really robust picture of the future in your big imaginings about what might be different, um, I don't think this is the right way to do it. You can do it for yourself if it helps you think. But if you're starting to talk about the future, people need to feel bought in on that or they're going to feel like you are attacking them. Uh, with the map rather than like inviting them to collaborate and think about um, that kind of change. Um, and a, an important sub point, because we're, we're running um, towards the end of time here, I know um, people, a uh, very common question, what do I do with the map when it's done? Like, how do you recommend sharing, socializing it? Um, so my, my, the best way to socialize this is to involve people, involve them in the process. The second best way to socialize it Please don't, just like any deliverable, don't just send people the content inventory. Don't just send them the audit. Don't just send them the map. Make a presentation in a deck about the map. Talk people through the process you went through, who was involved, why you did it, what you learned, what you're going to do next, just like any other piece of design work. I would not want to drop a random executive stakeholder into my like 50 screen customer journey map. That's ridiculous. Don't do that. Put a presentation together, do the work to guide people um, and do that with these maps as well. Presentations go a long way. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, we are coming up on time. Paul, is there anything last that you want to get in or? Oh, you're muted, Paula. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, so much there. Uh, and I feel like we could just go on for hours with this. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to uh, uh, point out um, because Scott is not promoting himself here, but I will do it for him. If you go to um, his site, I see you put a, a link there, but go to the consulting uh, uh, item in his, in his site navigation. If, you know, I think if you or your organization um, wants some expert one-on-one -on -one guidance in this, um, I think you could probably reach out to Scott and he does workshops and everything as he's mentioned. So, um, you know, and actually Paul, if I could, I'll do, this is, this is no usual thing, but I'm going to do one bit of self-promotion because I'm very excited about it. 
Um, so if you look at that link, I have, um, I'm doing a workshop at the end of the month. So it's a three and a half hour training. Um, cause I, I find like a lot of people get started with the articles and the guides and there's videos and all kinds of stuff. Um, and if you can get going from that, awesome. Um, some people like a hands-on thing. So I've got a training coming up at the end of the month. It does cost money. Um, but if people use the code, uh, content Seattle, that'll knock $200 off. So that's just for you all nice. want to register um feel free to do that so and yeah, I, if it's anything like if it's anything like the workshop you did at confab i would strongly recommend it i really enjoyed that thanks Larry. Cool. Yeah. yeah yeah thanks for offering that uh scott um <clears throat> yeah uh, the other thing is i would just say you know sorry just to kind of flip back um, reminder, check out contentstrategyseattle.org. Um, we'd love to have your feedback on the site. I mean, we'd like to have your participation, as I mentioned, if if you're able to or are interested in helping us kind of build out our resources there. But we'd also just love to hear what you think about it. And um, we'd love to see everybody back again at, at any of our other events. So um, that site and, of course, our Slack channel and Meetup are where you can kind of keep in touch with, with our events. And so... I um, hope to see everyone again soon. And once again, big thanks to Scott. This is super fun and super interesting. Mm -hmm.